this module, as I'm sure you're already aware, is going to be on ethics of data usage and security. And so it's going to be kind of broken up into three sections. I think I've given the learning objectives on the next slide. I think I have four items. So there's um, identifying harm stemming from genomic data privacy breaches, uh, understanding anonymi anonymization and its limitations in preserving privacy, uh, understanding how controlled access as a, works as an alternative uh, or complement. And finally, understanding why and how SSH is used to securely interact with the virtual machine. Um, but I'm, it's kind of, the, the, my presentation is kind of broken up into three parts. So it starts by asking kind of some of the big questions around uh, privacy and bioethics in genomic cloud computing. Next section talks a bit more about specifically some of the duties you might, you know, be asked to undertake in order to access uh, people's data. And then finally talking about security, some security concerns and focusing on, um, SSH connect connections to uh, cloud virtual machines, but talking about things a bit more broadly. Um, so the first kind of half is more privacy oriented. Um, and the topic is, is evolving rapidly and is quite timely. I mean, it's kind of maybe been timely for the last 20 years, but it continues to be. So this is an article from this Monday in the Globe and Mail talking about Canada's move towards uh, a genetic uh, anti-discrimination law. I'm not sure if people have been following this or not, but it's one of the debates that kind of recur in, um, in the fields of genetics. Um, many other countries where genetic uh, or genomic research is happening already have such laws. The U.S., of course, has 2008 uh, GINA, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination uh, non Act. Canada is perhaps moving towards this. Um, there's a bill that was passed in the Senate, and now Parliament's debating it. And so this is a, a, an article from three Toronto, uh, Toronto academics arguing for its adoption. And so they asked to consider the scenario where your child is suffering from a potentially fatal disorder. Um, after several arduous months of searching for an answer to its cause, you are offered a genetic test. The test may native give doctors a clue to explain the illness and help treat it. But the concern is then, um, if this information becomes available to, say, employers or, or insurers, is it possible to be discriminated against in all kinds of ways? And we've seen this kind of example in the U.S. where there, there have been employers who have, as part of their um, pre-employment medical screening, run genetic testing. And this is kind of one of the things that prompted uh, the U.S. Act. But it, it, it may seem a bit remote from the stuff we're doing where we're analyzing people's data in cloud in the bulk. But there's a number of, uh, a number of issues that come up that can, can be related related to this work, uh, either directly or indirectly. So I've listed, sorry? The first of many questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, are there cases in the US where people have been discriminated against and then they've used a non-discrimination law to just appeal and challenge and, and compare with that? That's a good question. I haven't encountered those, because most of the cases I've heard about came pre-2008. Like, there was a bunch of famous cases, including, um, I think it was an NFL player who was, I don't know if you followed that case, um, who was alleging genetic discrimination, but this came in 2006 or 2007. Since 2008, I'm actually not aware of, uh, that there may be Gina case law now, but I'm, I'm not actually aware of it. Is it something you've heard about? No, 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 I mean, it's either that the law works, and yeah, it seems like in in areas like insurance that are already pretty highly regulated, they tend to, you know, sometimes they'll push boundaries, but they tend to kind of comply with clear laws. So I so, wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't. Yeah, much. the insurance case is, is interesting because the, without doing genetic tests, you can ask a lot of genetic questions and get, you know, you know does your mother or father have this X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. disease? So you don't have a genetic test, but you know you have a percent chance of just having it. Yeah. And then you can sort of, you know, sort of weigh your odds of insurance costs against 50% as opposed to 100%. Yeah, the last time I, I presented in this room, actually, there was kind of an intense debate that broke out between people. Because some people don't see a problem, right? Because they're like, we already are, insurers are already asking all kinds of health questions. Exactly. Yeah. What's the harm? Other people see, and it becomes, you know, the way discrimination works in law is, I mean, discrimination happens all the time and is accepted. It's usually there's prohibited grounds of discrimination, such as race, gender, all the things we were normally used to thinking of. And so it becomes more, more a social question. Is, is discrimination based on you know, your genetic predispositions or genetic history something we are willing to accept as a society or are not willing to accept? And I mean, you, you can get into more concrete that are less values-laden debates about it too. So for example, there's some people who argue that if we prohibit all genetic discrimination in insurance, 
uh, what that'll mean is that people will go and get tested anyways, and then those who aren't predisposed won't buy insurance, and then insurance will go up. And so there's this argument too, although it, it will depend on your value system. If there's a genetic predisposition, predisposition to smoking, and they ask you if you're a smoker or not, you say, well, I'm, I'm a smoker, but I have a predisposition for it. So it's a genetic... Oh, a genetic predisposition to to uh, <laughs> to a habit like smoking. Yeah. That would be. Are you aware of it? There would be such a test. You know. It would be an interesting link to make. <laughs> um, but anyways, I should move back. I, I'm worried that I've put too many slides in here and might not get through them. But so I've listed a bunch of harms, including the discrimination, and especially laws will target insurance and employment, um, and of course. Genetic, genomic information is kind of inherently health information and really it itself has the potential to give information about our predisposition to certain kinds of diseases and conditions. But then also with the increasing amount that we're storing genomic data alongside phenotypic data, it's possible that uh, for people who have access to that, having their genetic information released could release that phenotypic information kind of indirectly because you can associate it with those people. Um, so if you're, say, in a, in a database of people with a specific disease, uh, it's, but your name isn't included, but your genetic data is, it's possible that people could, uh, could identify that. Paternity information, obviously, is one that comes up uh, fairly often with its genetic testing. And it's, some of these issues have led to the, whole, the creation of this new, new area of genetic counselors that are mandatory in lots of cases now. Um, when, when genetic data is used the biometric identifier, it can be linked with identity theft. Uh, we talked already a bunch about the kind of legal jeopardy issues, post, especially people have been aware of post the Snowden revelations. So there's on the law enforcement side and the national security side, there's a lot of concerns. I haven't talked so much in this, pres or I'm not planning to talk so much about this presentation about the kind of international border crossing stuff that Francis uh, alluded to a bit before, but we can if you like. But kind of the, the biggest issue actually is, is future uses. A lot of the, the harms uh, that I've listed, we haven't seen so, so much of, but things are moving so fast in terms of uh, uh, genetic research and our ability to sequence DNA cheaply, to have people's DNA available, to do different things to it. Um, and so it becomes, it's a bit unclear to, to kind of gauge, but one, one of the things is, for example, with other kinds of private information, like say my, my credit card or my bank information, if, if that's somehow compromised, it's, it's bad. I could have quite a bit of money stolen, or, or maybe not, as the case may be. But, um, but uh, at the end of the day, what I can do then is I can, once that happens, once that information is compromised, I can close my bank account, close down my credit card, get a new credit card number. But if, you're, if your genetic data or your genomic data is compromised, you can't you know, close down your genetic account and open a new one. It's kind of the, the DNA you're stuck with for your life. So there's, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about DNA stasis. It's, it's static over the course of our lives. And it also, it, it's tricky because it also reveals information about others. So one of the big debates currently actually is even whether we should be specifically making laws and policies around genetics at all. So there's the, the non-discrimination one is where there's, there's been a clear trend for genetic non-discrimination um, kind of legislation and policy. But in some cases, people are arguing, well, we already have laws that address privacy. We already have laws that address, and regulations that address confidentiality. We already have even health-specific ones. Why do we need to talk about genomics? And it's a debate that's ongoing, that's unsettled. Um, but th this is a, kind of, this graph comes out of a fairly recent uh, academic piece where the authors were trying to make a case that there is something specific about genetic information that does require, in some cases, not all specific regulation. It's the coincidence of these kind of six factors they identify. Because even the stuff like I talked about not being able to close down my you know, G DNA and get a new copy, that's actually generalizable to kind of all biometrics, right? I mean, some to some degree, maybe some biometrics you can change, but for the most part, not. You're not going to get a new set of fingerprints. You're not going to get all this other data. But so in, in these authors' um, kind of estimation, the coincidence of these six factors uh, mean we need specific rules around uh, genomics. Others disagree strongly. So it's an ongoing debate. Um, and so now, again, Francis kind of alluded to this before, but what we end up with at, at the current time, apart from this uh, non-discrimination, uh, kind of the laws around non-discrimination, what we have are basically general, general legal duties and general policy duties that apply to handling of genomic data that aren't so specific. And so there's, for example, uh, personal information protection law. And again, it's quite fractured. So we have different distinct sets of laws in Canada, at least, that govern uh, kind of the public sector, privacy law, private sector, and health sectors, all of which can, can apply 
to genomic research depending on the context. The health sector you might think would cover everything, but those laws tend to apply only to kind of a hospital context or that kind of more specific, which doesn't apply to in a lot of research contexts. We've also got different laws across provinces and federally, uh, so it becomes a bit confusing, although they tend to be similar. It, be it can become a bit confusing about which specific laws even apply in a given uh, research project, especially given that projects can span provinces and even countries quite easily. Um, another kind of big area of law is uh, ethical research oversight, and so people in the kind of academic, nonprofit, and, and other contexts where you're getting a lot of uh, kind of public public funding are often subjected to institutional review. Uh, increasingly now there's data access compliance offices that will ask to review projects and we're, we'll talk about uh, the ICGC, especially DACO, but in general DACO's a bit later uh, before getting access to people's data. And the third one I've listed here is there's an increasing desire to kind of get access to people's clinical data, which is more controversial because people haven't explicitly consented to that the way you can consent to having your data used in research. And so there's pa patient confidentiality duties that come up in that context. But that last question, I mean, if the issue is, is the fact that it wasn't consented, mm -hmm. if it was consented, then it's the same issue. Clinical versus genomic. Yeah, I mean, one of the tricky things is when you go see your, consult your doctor, even if they say, oh, by the way, do you want mind if all your data is used for research? There's a sense that you might be feeling a bit more compelled to say yes because you're going there seeking treatment than if you just voluntarily show up to participate in a research project? Is that kind of addressing what you're saying? Or? Well, I mean, I'm saying but there's some clinical data that is not available because it wasn't consented properly. Well, not so much. Opposed to, like, definitely you have to give informed consent in order to be treated, right? But yes. the idea is but can't, so you haven't necessarily consented to having your data used for research. So let's say I've got pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. which I don't, I want to see. Mm -hmm. My, my uh, doctor, and he says, oh, I'm part of this big international mm -hmm. genomics project. Do you want your DNA and your clinical information to be part of this project? It'll be anonymous. It'll be very easy. Mm -hmm. He explains to me all the, but that, it, I would say, is it a proper consent process. Mm -hmm. That said, I think most clinicians are probably able to enable the consent out of any patient that they, you know, wish to. This is one of the reasons I think there's extra protections there, right? Because yeah. it's you are in a more vulnerable situation, yeah, exactly. um, and so not to say it's impossible, but um, um, but if it's consented properly, then it, the issue is if it's not consented, then it can be used. Yeah, they, there, so there are certain through kind of the research ethics board, there are sometimes exceptions where placed under strict controls that are supposed to safeguard people, excuse me, confidentiality. There can sometimes be, you know, exception, other ways to get at data other than explicit consent at least. Yeah. But um, it's kind of a new field and, and clinicians also often take their confidentiality duties very, very seriously. And there's much more pushback than from researchers as far as data sharing. So there's a bit, a bit of a, yeah, a tug now, to right? Deal with. And so, but in the ICGC, which we're looking at, which is our favorite example right now, mm -hmm. I think it was very clear to all clinicians when we started the project that they had to share the mm. data from the 25,000 patients yeah. that we made worldwide. And we had so much pushback from the clinicians mm -hmm. about the clinical data. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. It's a really different kind of culture, it seems like, between clinicians okay. and the research okay. side. Yeah. And now we're entering a new project second ICGC, ICGC Med, and, and that was going to go into clinical trials, so it's going to be even more, mm -hmm. we have to, I'm, I'm not sure, not fully satisfied yet that they're going to, the mechanism to make sure that that that's resolved. It'll be interesting to see how that project goes forward in particular. Um, I'm kind of glossing over, these are all kind of big topics, but the thing I wanted to bring up was well, we've already we've already actually been talking about it. Was the, one of the unifying threads between them is the idea of informed consent, uh, and so through all these, wh whether you're dealing with uh, kind of personal information protection or privacy law, uh, researchers' duties and and clinicians, uh, informed consent is kind of supposed to be the idea that people have some kind of control or say over their, their data. There's a tension there too, as sometimes it becomes reduced to more of a checkbox, I agree or don't agree kind of thing, like a cell phone. Almost maybe I don't want to say it's like a cell phone. Uh, contract, but there's a tension, a tension there too. And so 
Again, this is something Francis was talking about, but when you get a project like uh, the International Cancer Genome Consortium that's worldwide, that has projects in a variety of countries where the consents that were collected, it's tough to get them all to be uh, uniform, so people haven't necessarily all consented to the exact same thing in the exact same way. Yeah, you go ahead. You try. I mean, you, you yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the uh, bar mm -hmm. they, they basically they provided a template for the consent, but each project was allowed to adapt it culturally to mm -hmm. their country, basically. And that made for some very interesting challenges. Yeah. But I think they tried to basically make it all the same, but there was some. And the legal, the a couple of those cultural kind of reasons, but there's also legal reasons where certain it, the rules of informed consent don't always work the same way the rules of, uh, of research oversight, etc. I mean, we talked about, I already talked about the different laws across just Canada. So if you think worldwide, it becomes a real. Um, well, there was one country which actually didn't generate any data, but said that everybody except this country is allowed to use our data. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't generate. Okay, well that makes it makes it easy, I guess. Yeah, but I don't think it would have been allowed. It would have been allowed to work. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so it becomes tricky, especially as genomics projects like like the ICGC become so internationalized um, to fulfill all these duties at once. Uh, but moving on, I talked a bit about harms to pe people whose genomic data is being analyzed, but there's also potential har harms resulting from privacy or confidentiality breaches breaches to uh, researchers. Um, which, in case of breach or misuse, uh, you know, you can this, the generalized notion that people will lose confidence in the field will be less likely to be willing to share their data. Um, which, if we want this research to continue, is important. Uh, individual researchers can risk having their funding can, uh, canceled. Um, there's also kind of reputational is issues within uh, and kind of community sanctions, which which are uh, can be really significant. Uh, there are certain fines that exist under different privacy laws for breach, and occasionally, we don't see this so much in Canada, but there can be criminal or penal sanctions. Uh, I've cited one case here in Europe uh, where I, I don't think it was actually carried out, but there was a six-month jail sentence ordered in a Google Italy case. But also in the U.S., uh, I'm not sure if people are familiar with HIPAA, but it's, it's the biggest uh, kind of... Uh, health information privacy law in the US, and it also allows for criminal sanctions in certain cases. Um, on top of this, some of the novel risks we're seeing can complicate informed consent, right? So we've been talking about stuff like law enforcement surveillance and Patriot, Patriot Act surveillance, and we've been talking about genetic discrimination. How exactly do you, because the idea of informed consent is the, the idea of being informed is supposed to be very broad. You should have an idea of the risks which you're subjecting yourself to. And so how do you communicate to people, oh, by the way, there's also a chance that the NSA might harvest your data and do, we're not sure what with it. There's also this, mutation. sorry? Analyze your mutation. Exactly, analyze your mutation, get, give you back results. Um, so it becomes, it's, all these things are, there's really a strain happening kind of in uh, the privacy and policy making field around some of these issues. Um, and regulation that becomes overly com and needlessly cumbersome uh, can stall research. So if there are incompat incompatibilities between different pos between different jurisdictions or, or different organizations uh, that are you know not based on cultural or other factors we might think are significant, uh, it can cause huge delays. Uh, we've already kind of talked about this a bit, but so again, pushing on this tension. Since the beginning of the Human Genome Project, there's been a huge recognition that this data is, uh, is extremely important to human health. And we've seen kind of through the open data and open science movement since the very beginning, there's been strong pushes for it. So even as early as 1993, there was an NIH uh, DOE joint subcommittee that put out guidelines encouraging the rapid release of data uh, because of its, its benefits to other scientists. And we've seen this increase kind of over time, we're now you know, seeing basically all funder, funding agencies requiring genomic data to be released uh, rapidly so that it, the most uh, kind of health benefits can be made out of it. So it's this kind of tension between uh, increasing privacy risks, but also increasing pushes to, to release data. Uh, again, kind of the same, I think Francis might have had this exact same graph, but we can see the exponential growth um, in kind of genomic data being generated. And then again, kind of, I'm I, maybe repeating a lot of what Francis went no, through. I, that, I think, um, okay, <laughs> maybe I'm stealing someone else's thunder. But the idea is that 
Um, with the amount of data we're now generating, cloud computing seems to be the, if not the only way, then at least a much more efficient way to, to process and analyze this data. Uh, and so that's kind of um, pushed for this turn to happen, but there's also certain risks associated with cloud computing. One of them is, uh, especially if you're dealing with a big company like Amazon, your bargaining power, if you're a smaller research team, might not be as much. If you're a much bigger institution, you might be able to um, get a better deal for yourself. And I'm not just talking economically, but even in terms of setting the uh, setting the kind of contractual rules about whether they can change your agreement whenever they feel like, with or without notifying you, uh, and this kind of thing. I mean, one of the things that Amazon has done is that it's the same with all the other commercial cloud providers, is that they take no liability whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Since we changed, so we changed uh, the the consent form on on the ice on the DACO on mm -hmm. the, the agreement. So we and so basically the opposite. Then if it's not the cloud provider, then it's OICR that becomes the next sort of mm. target. And so we've actually ordered it so that the OICR doesn't take any liability either. Mm -hmm. And then now we're having Yan instead of taking about a week to accept a, an application. In some cases, it's taking as long as a month. Okay. So with the lawyers at the institution, uh, they okay. don't want to take the risk either. Yeah. So they have their tech office saying, well, no, we don't want to take the risk. You guys take the risk. So nobody wants to take the risk. And uh, so an agreement now that it used to take a week is now taking a month. Okay. Of, of Jan's time. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'll come back, to, come back to that in a bit too, actually. But so the, the tension has kind of resulted in obviously people searching for some way out of this to kind of get the best of both worlds. And until maybe 10 years ago, perhaps or perhaps more, people really had looked to um, anonymization as kind of the solution to, to all these concerns. It could solve informed con the problem of informed consent, privacy breach, it can allow us to have data for research. Uh, and it's based on, I mean, from the legal side, it's based on this idea that privacy law and, and these other laws only their duties only regulate to what's called personal data. Access your process again. Yeah. No worries. I think you have to define that word in anonymization because it came up again at the Boston about with respect because um, uh, incidental findings and getting back to the patient information about the yeah. genome. But if it's anonymized, I mean, there's the, the break, there's a break between the exactly. databases. So there's no way to reconnect the genome. So yeah, sure. So I'm happy to talk about that. So, the, but the basic idea here is that if if there's no way, as opposed to having a private ID, they don't exactly. Have a party known. So it's kind of two main ways of thinking about this. I wasn't necessarily going to go into it, but it is important, especially in the research context. So you can either take data and kind of strip off. You you can either just strip. There's a few different ways actually. You can just strip off direct identifiers. You can say we don't store this person's name or their telephone number or anything else like that with the data. Therefore, we can't figure out who it is. Um, and therefore it's anonymized, therefore they can't experience any harms, so it doesn't need to be regulated. There we've got kind of the best of all possible worlds. Uh, we can use the data without exposing anyone to privacy risks. This is kind of, I guess this is kind of the idea maybe 10 years ago or more. Um, another possibility is instead of stripping off all that data, you can keep a, uh, you know, some kind of random number or a code that will allow you when linked to another database to re-identify that person for purposes like the ones that Francis talked about which in Europe they often refer to as pseudonymization. Uh, in North America, more often they call it coding. Uh, there's a bunch of different names. One of the things when you're talking about anonymization is it's important, uh, if, if, assuming you want to be clear, to, to define the terms like you just asked me to very carefully because they are also used in different ways. So there's words like de-identification and anonymization that are used totally differently around the world. Um, and so it, it is important to be precise. Um, Unfortunately, as maybe I've been kind of suggesting already, there's been a real loss of confidence in anonymization as a means to kind of reconcile all of these different concerns, and especially as kind of more and more sophisticated re-identification attacks have, have come up. Um, and, again, and again, this this isn't anonymization isn't specific to genomic research, but is important within it. It's it's kind of applies more broadly to privacy concerns. And so the first kind of things that started coming up were similar kind of open data, big data things where AOL, for example, said, 
we're going to release for kind of the public good or for crowdsourcing purposes, release a whole bunch of uh, thousands of users uh, search queries. Uh, and people can, you know, analyze this and get kind of inf interesting information about people out of it. Uh, but we've anonymized it because we've taken off people's names and their phone numbers and whatever. But unfortunately, they hadn't realized, I guess, that people have a tendency to do things like search for their own name. And so within a few weeks, people came out saying, oh, we've identified, you know, a, a dozen or more people, kind of re-identified this supposedly de-identified data. That's kind of an easy example or a simple one. But over time, there have been more and more sophisticated re-identification attacks. So, for example, Netflix released um, just a set of people's movie viewing habits without their names and information to say, can someone crowdsource us a better algorithm to you know, recommend the next movie they're going to want to watch? And soon after that, people said, oh, I figured out that this person is the one who watched all these movies. This And so after kind of all these, these kind of escalating breaches in, in creative, ever new creative ways, there's been a real... Game code, right? Sorry? Game yeah, yeah. I mean, that's more in the in this more health specific context rather than generally. But so this is kind of increasingly um, the consensus is now that you can't fully anonymize data and have it remain useful. I mean, this may be some exceptions to that, but um, this is especially so in the case of high dimensional data. Sometimes people talk about geolocation as having some of the same features, but I think genomics is really kind of the ultimate in high dimensional data. Um, so this is one scholar named Paul Ohm who's um, he argues, I, I don't think I would go this far, but that privacy laws should continue to apply to even fully de-identified data, at least for more sensitive forms. Uh, but like, and also like Francis just mentioned, there are concerns, criticisms of anonymization that have come up that aren't specific to privacy, but so this is basically exactly what Francis said, that on the basis of research duties or ethical duties. So one of them is, the, one of the ideas of informed consent is, is that consent isn't like a contract in the way that you're making agree, an agreement with someone and you're both bound to it after. Consent is, um, it's just kind of something that you, uh, agreement that you willingly give, but you can withdraw at any time. So in the context of research, you're supposed to be able to withdraw. But if we can't even figure out which data is yours because we fully anonymized it, we can't do that anymore. Uh, so there's some people who are criticizing it, anonymization based on this ground. And similarly with um, the duty to return incidental findings. So that's referring to cases where, say, you're not looking for a specific um, kind of, you know, disease or condition, but you find someone in your data set who has, it, it's normally kind of the, the key cases or the kind of paradigmatic case is someone who you come across who has a really serious disease that we also have a very strong treatment for. Uh, there's an increasing kind of argument that you have a, an ethical obligation to return that information to that person so they can act on it. And so if the, if the data is anonymous, it doesn't allow that either. Uh, in our ICPC med context is that you may find biomarkers which would make somebody qualify for a clinical trial that they didn't know about, but mm -hmm. you may be bound to invite them to it mm -hmm. because they now have the right sort of biomarkers that would make them ideal candidates for a clinical trial. It becomes tough for yeah for research reliability at what point like there's no obligation to actually actively look for these things if you're not looking for them but the question is more if you happen to come across something yeah. what what point you know how far does this obligation go and there's some different I was reading a case about this kind of thing yesterday actually it's interesting because it's not totally clear exactly how far it extends um, and so some other criticisms just based on the fact that as anonymization becomes increasingly difficult it means you have to kind of strip more and more data away to try to be sure that that the data is actually properly anonymized and that kind of hinders the research value. Um, now getting kind of more specific to the genomic context, even as recently as about 10 years ago, there were arguments being put forward that, at least my reading of what, of what uh, this academic is saying is that so long kind of as you strip off the person's name, phone number, et cetera, we can consider this, we can consider data anonymous. Um, and so, that, and there, there, I think even more recently have been people saying, come on, really, or how are you going to re-identify someone if you just have a bunch of base of their base pairs, you don't have a name attached to that. But more recently, there's in this, in this field, like others, there's been kind of a series of ever more sophisticated re-identification techniques. Um, I've got a, a subsample of them here. Um, there's, there's others I've left out, but so in 2004, um, one paper found that 75 uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms could uniquely identify someone, which is not the same thing as saying, to, you know, tell you what their name is, but they would uniquely pinpoint that person as opposed to someone else. Uh, 
Uh, a really famous kind of an important study was done in 2008 by uh, Homer and uh, colleagues who showed that uh, partial genetic information could be used to identify a person as belonging to either a studies control or affected group. And this one had a huge ramification. Sorry, go ahead. Um, if we, in a real situation, we had uh, 7 billion genome sequencing mm -hmm. somewhere in the cloud, so the first statement would be very true. But otherwise, uh, if I have the 75 SNPs uh, from somebody, I mean, how can I identify this person? Well, wait until the GIMREC paper from 2013. Um, <laughs> so, but first, to I just want to talk the about... Paper, uh, it's critical. The Homer paper is important because it was specifically using... So the, in the U.S., there's a, a giant database you may know of called the dbGaP, the database base of genotypes and phenotypes. And it had initially been largely or exclusively open access, so people could, people could access it very easily. And the data actually in the Homer paper that they were analyzing was from that database, and it was supposedly actually aggregate or it was aggregate data, so you can almost analogously think of it as something not quite like a like census data, but where you know if you think but it's GWAS, so it was yeah. like the SNP data, so it's thousands of SNPs per individual. But you could tell, but if you only had let's say seventy five SNPs as you suggest, mm -hmm. you could just compare them and see are those seventy five SNPs more common in a schizophrenic group or in a mm -hmm. group? and so and and you could therefore say aha you're more likely schizophrenic and then that kind of information is now open and so if you have 75 SNPs from, from somebody you can then match and I think it went down to as few as 12 the right mm. number of SNPs uh, if there were rare SNPs that could be used to identify the individual yeah. to know which group they belong to the control or the affected yeah so you could see if someone yeah, had the disease being uh, researched or not height and BMI or you know weight and stuff like that it's not a big deal but Schizophrenia, alcoholism, there's a bunch of other diseases where you wouldn't want to be necessarily associated with them. Yeah. Publicly. And so this this paper kind of sent shockwaves through the field, and it, the it ended up that they took the, the dbGaP data off of being open access. It was no longer available to the public at large, which I'll come back to. So then the, the GIMREC paper in 2013 was interesting because they actually were able to through you know sites like Ancestry.com and others that have come up, they were able to actually go back and link uh, bioinformatic profiles to databases to re-identify uh, people with their names up to 10% up to of the cases. I, I think it was exclusively males because of, I forget exactly the method, but it was using patrilineality and so people sharing their last name through, through the, the males line. Uh, but it was an interesting and another new creative kind of way of doing it. Uh, and then most recently, this was this paper by Kai, who was uh, able to re-identify based on 25 only randomly ran, randomly select, selected uh, SNPs uh, based on Welcome Trust data. So it, I think it would be hard at this point to say that you know a whole genome sequence is anonymized the way that people seem to maybe be thinking it was uh, 10 years ago. And so there's there's been kind of this kind of crisis of confidence and anonymization. It's, it's important to be aware of because it's still used quite a bit and talked about quite a bit, but it's no longer seen as the solution that can solve our uh, the kind of tension that I was talking about before. So with that kind of collapse, there's been a bunch of new approaches on all kinds of uh, in all kinds of areas, from technological to organizational and legal, to try to fill the gaps. And so that I'll briefly mention some of the technological ones. Um, uh, so, for example, some of them that are, that are quite interesting, I think, are, are new no novel cryptographic methods, methods that are somewhat anonymization-like. Um, the, the one I've got kind of in the graph here is uh, an example from a project called Data Shield, where essentially you're doing, it's, it's similar in the sense that it's um, similar, I mean, to aggregate statistics in that you've got data distributed across different repositories that you can run kind of aggregate studies on and statistics on without having to reveal the individual's data and get results back. Um, a second example, so this, this, the generalized version of this kind of technique is called secure multi-party computing. Um, the second technique I've got uh, listed here is homomorphic encryption, which I'm not sure if people have heard of or not, but it's kind of, in theory, it's ideally situated to the cloud context. Because the idea, it's, it's I think, quite amazing. The, the notion is that you can send people's data encrypted into the cloud, which that's that's pretty standard. We can do that quite easily. Uh, but not only that, you can actually send encrypted instructions for analysis into the cloud. Uh, 
have Amazon run those that analysis without knowing what it is, return a result that remains anonymized, uh, and so you're able to kind of leverage this cloud infrastructure without disclosing any details to the cloud. It, it's pretty ingenious. The drawback, unfortunately, is that it hasn't so much... There's been several kind of academic paper proof of concepts that have come out, but it hasn't scaled yet to kind of real world situations as you know in as generalizable way as we might like but it's a, it's a promising kind of new technique um, so so far these haven't filled the gaps but are interesting similarly there's there's uh, um, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a technique but at least a, an analysis or, or a new approach being put forward by uh, a researcher from Microsoft especially called differential privacy and here the idea is it's interesting in, in that it's actually intended to be future proof. So you're intended to able intended to be able to use mathematical formula to be able to say, based on the results that we're publishing and making available, never in, it's mathematically provable that no matter what happens in the future, that, uh, a person won't be able to be re-identified. And the way you essentially do it with this is again dealing usually with kind of aggregate results, is by running statistics um, on the result to kind of figure out whether any individual's participation in the study or not, if that will affect their privacy in any way, on up to a very small threshold. Uh, and essentially what they do is if it doesn't meet that threshold, they add a bit of noise into, into the equation uh, until they get the result they want. And so it's similarly has had some real world uses, but is limited um, because you know noise injection is gonna degrade data. One of, one of the problems is there's kind of an inherent tension also between anonymization and the kind of genomics research people are, are doing where they're actually looking more often and more interested in the outliers and it, what you want to do in anonymization is explicitly get rid of the outliers in order to so there's kind of an inherent tension there that makes things hard to scale to the real world um, so now I'll move on to what's been one of the more commonly used in genomics alternatives since um, since this kind of crisis of confidence in anonymization which is controlled access uh, kind of regimes. This is what dbGaP in the U.S. moved to after the Homer um, paper was published. And so we used to have kind of fully open access data, and now we've got kind of two different tiers. We've got open access and controlled access data. This is an example of the ICGC data sets that they keep in each. And uh, my sense is that the distinction is is based more on, maybe Francis can fill in the gap, but my understanding is the distinction is that controlled access is considered to be more identifiable yes. and open access not. So does it have, does it also take into account the sensitivity or is that not kind of, is it more just identifiability? Identifiability. 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 And so, 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 which one, which character are you worried about? Like, it's not sensitive? Well, I mean, Generally, the way the kind of laws and policies work is they have big categories of sensitivity, but usually it would do things like include all health data as being sensitive. Yeah. And so maybe you don't, maybe it's not broken down that way, but, um, um, so, but you could imagine some health data being less sensitive than others, right? So, for example, like geographical location mm -hmm. was uh, of concern, so it had to be kept at the, like they say in Canada, it had to be kept at the provincial level, not at the city level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but even now, if you've got a rare tumor type in the eye, you're probably going to be really fine. <laughs> yeah. But then the, the flip side of that is, you know, if you want to find out who has cancer, you go hang out at the cancer clinic and you say, call in Mr. Wallet. And uh, so you know Mr. Wallet has cancer. Yeah. It's, so, so, you know, hiding my clinical data by yelling out my name at the waiting exactly. room at the cancer clinic. Yeah. And of course, if you ask the neighbor, they all know who has cancer as well. Yeah. And so, but with respect to, uh, I mean, the, the major one, of course, is things that could identify the individual. So, mm -hmm. genomic sequences, be it from RNA or DNA, um, and uh, geolocation, uh, that's two to find. And even for the older patients, if you're above age, like it becomes an age bracket. And so yeah. if you're 92, that's two, that becomes identifiable. If you're 92 living with blue eye, uh, you know, it's probably like 10. A lot of this stuff you're talking about is similar to. So the law I talked about in the U.S. HIPAA has a specific rule about how you de-identify data, and it says you know you can only use the first three digits of the person's zip code because yeah. all five are too 
uh, too narrow, o people who are over 80 years, I think, similar to what you're saying. And so it's, it's interesting because there's been some, there was one famous case about 15 years ago where there was a researcher, um, I forget her name right now, that people refer to her as the queen of re-identification, but she found that based on someone's birth date, sex, and zip code? Yeah, I think she could identify like 86% of the U.S. That would uniquely identify 86% of the U.S. population. So like all, you know, almost everyone, uh, which at the time was seen as surprising because it was seen as, you know, this data, how are you going to put that together to... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, I think the whole thing in terms of this, you know, was a good example of, you know, we want open data, blah, 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 but then all of a sudden it becomes, you know, somebody actually challenges the mm -hmm. premise and actually goes, same with the encode data, they actually were able to all open data, but now you have, then you can merge that with that phone books and, and yeah. zip codes and whatnot, and you're able to identify people who are red, you know, and they did it in you know, high percentage. Yeah, things have really changed. And so. What the Barker referred to as trending hackers. Although, yeah, I think she's maybe sarcastic, but I, I actually, <laughs> I mean. It, well, they accept they wrote a paper about it. So, I mean, they declared themselves. The hackers are yeah. usually more considered to be doing it in the background. These guys actually wrote a paper in science. Yeah, people sometimes distinguish between black hat ha hackers and white hat hackers, yes. right? Where the yeah. black hat ones are trying to get your inf information to do devious right. things, and the white hat ones are trying to find, expose flaws in order that they can be fixed. Yeah. And so I think they would see themselves in the latter category. I find them to be helpful too. Uh, I mean, as so long, you know, if they're not trying to compromise things, but actually trying to strengthen the security but and privacy know, systems. I'm on, the, I'm on the other side of trying to make. So we build like the ICBC mm -hmm. source. There's lots of open data, especially. But all the, the controlled access data, which you know has all sorts of nefarious things, yeah. about, it basically there's there's hardly no eyeballs on that data. I mean, it's very if you consider the amounts, mm. the millions of dollars that have been spent, like billions basically across yeah. the world, uh, and we have about like a thousand users that are looking mm. at controlled access data. It's, I think it's, it's 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 like the bar is, was too high. Mm. I think it's set too high. So it's too conservative in my mind. Mm. So it's protecting everybody, but it's protecting it so that nobody's looking at it. So I mean, I think we're hurting the mission of the ICBC mm. by not allowing, uh, making the bar lower so mm. that more people look at the data. Yeah, it's tough with the, uh, because people are always looking for the win-win, but at some point it becomes a bit of a tension between the privacy research and it's where yeah. you're going to set the bar. Is it too far one way? Is it too far the other? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go through a bit, just, oh, was there a hand there? Sorry. Just, just a small comment. So you're saying now that uh, every second person going to get cancer within his uh, lifetime. lifetime, so it's going to be such a common event that you don't really need to fight it anymore. It's just going to be staged in our life. Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's either treatable or even preventable in some sort. Yes. So maybe in this case, this information is going to be more likely to be shared. And I think, uh, I mean, Barker was, you know, the bar should, could, should be, you know, I am a scientist, you know, and so publicly mm -hmm. I have an ORCID ID, so I'm a scientist with a, a identifiable, you know, identifier. That maybe is all I need to do to be able to access the data. I don't have to go mm -hmm. through this whole complicated sort of process that prevents me from looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally respect and work with, you know, all the, the rules and regulations that are imposed on me and so forth. But I, at the same time, I, as, in a way, as a patient advocate, you know, I could argue for we need to lower the bar to have more scientists look at the data, because if you have no eyeballs on the data, nobody's going to make discoveries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a real, there's a real tension. So I was going to go through next some of the ICGC data. No, no, but it's, it's, it's dealing, I'm not trying to brush off your no, comment, no, no, like no, I'm, no, I'm, no, uh, no. I'm uh, wanting to delve into it more deeply, actually, uh, because so there is all there is all this data that you can it's indexed in the ICGC data portal. You can look at it as of now. So the the collaboratory is set up to work with this ICGC data, um, including the controlled access portion. And I'm going to show a bit of kind of if you want to access this data for a future project, the process you go through, um, which is essentially by heading to uh, is it up here ICGC.org/slash. DACO, 
to the data access compliance office and you essentially set up an account and ask for the data and kind of like Francis was just saying there's certain requirements you have to fulfill one of the big ones that he was mentioning was so I think I've got a few slides here just on kind of going through the process um, you know log in create your account um, and then you get to the next, kind of next step is you get to the application the app application form has a bunch of sections and including so I think B, so first you have to give your name. B is name of the authorized institutional representative, including affiliation and contact details. And I think this is what we were getting at, where at, at this point you have to have an institution that's willing to kind of sign off on your access and is being is going to take responsibility for the proper handling of the data. Uh, and which, the idea is that somebody can fire you. The idea is that someone is keeping you accountable, I guess. Well, yeah. I but the idea is that if you screw up, mm -hmm. which, by the way, nobody has ever done this. Mm -hmm. Well, then they can go to your super, like, let's say it's the, uh, if you're at the university, mm -hmm. it would be the, let's say, the VP Research's office, or yeah. the, the, the office that signs off on the grants, whatever they are. And so they would sign off on your DACO application. And so they are saying, yes, first of all, this person is a member of our institution. Mm -hmm. And he or she will act appropriately, and if they don't, we'll take care of it. That's basically what the yeah. institution yeah, and like you were saying a minute ago, one of the next steps might be, and people are looking at is, can, so I had kind of those two databases of controlled access, open access, people are looking at maybe there should be an intermediary zone somewhere between, for either data that's a bit less sensitive or is less identifiable, where you would still have to go through a process, but it might be slightly less onerous, and especially, I think it's focusing especially on this kind of second, you have, you have to have an institution that's willing to sign off on you, and I, and I think they're thinking of cases, for example, where I mean, these are more rare, but there are cases where, for example, someone will have someone in their family with a particularly rare disease. Uh, it'll, you know, touch them very deeply, and they'll start looking into it more and more, and they'll almost become, I don't know if people with familiar with the idea of citizen scientists, but they'll almost become uh, experts in that field of this one rare disease. And so there's an argument to be made that that person has a good interest in having access to data about people who are, uh, you know, afflicted by that disease. Uh, and should have access to the data. They don't have, they're not linked to an institution, so they have no way of having someone sign off on them. Um, the difficulty becomes a bit is how do you maintain accountability um, but also give as much access as possible? So it's something that's still kind of being very much worked out in the policy and regulatory fields as far as how, where this bar should be set essentially. But for now, at least for the ICGC data, this is the, the process we've got is the, uh, the ICGC controlled access form. There's, uh, no, so not only the institutional affiliation, but you have to give information about your project. It looks a bit like institutional review, um, uh, kind of ethics review, if you've done that before. It's a similar kind of process. Um, there's a data access agreement that you have to sign off on with a bunch, a uh, whole bunch of conditions, including, uh, you know, you won't try to re-identify any, any of the individuals. Because in, in both of the open access and controlled access databases, we still don't have any, any directly identifying information. There's, there's no one's name in there. Uh, but part of the idea is that the controlled access data is more identifiable, and so you won't try to do that. You won't inappropriately disclose it. Uh, and you'll follow kind of all the other policies that are listed in the application. Um, and I think I've got them kind of listed here. There's a bunch of, I kind of tried to group them under categories. You're asked to, they're each, they're, they're mostly pretty short, I think, two or three pages each. Some run longer. But you're asked when you're signing up for DACO approval to read and abide by the policies, including um, ICGC's guidelines. Oh, they're not coming up. So, oh, right, here we go. So I tried to group them a bit. Um, so the, there's a bunch of different kind of smaller obligations that come into play. So the IC, ICGC guidelines 2008 is kind of a broad policy document, although it does include some more specific updates. For example, there's a publications guideline. Um, that has some information about if you want to publish in an academic journal or elsewhere the results of your research. There's certain obligations, for example, to uh, credit ICGC or the, the people who's uh, the project who collected the data. But there's also obligations around, before we were talking about kind of the obligation to rapidly release data. In some cases now it's, or for quite a while, it's, some people expect within 24 hours of generating data it should be released into open access databases. Uh, and one of the trade-offs for that was people worried that there was a worry that people wouldn't be willing to do that if someone else was going to start analyzing it and then scoop them and get a publication out first on the same data. 
And so one of the techniques to avoid that is there's uh, an established practice of setting up embargo periods where you upload data for everyone to use, but no one else is allowed to publish on it until you have first had a chance to or some time limit uh, expires. We got a hand up there? Yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's actually it's a bit more graphic. So you're allowed to publish it, if, so you, the, the genomes are available. So if you're gene hunting for one specific gene, mm -hmm. you can go publish it right away if you found it. Mm -hmm. if you look at what your ICPC is trying to protect against is people doing like analysis of 100 genomes, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, so they want, so there's an embargo period but if there is 100, so if you publish, let's say, you release 100 genomes, you have um, you have one year, basically, to, to not do anything. Mm -hmm. But then you have to, then people, if you haven't done anything, and it's like, I think it's two years, actually two years, if you haven't done anything, in the two years since you've released a genome, then somebody is able to, can and is encouraged to do the whole genome analysis. Yeah. And so, but if, if the first genome came out, you didn't reach 100 for a year, but then you have, a, then at one year you do reach 100, then you have one other year. But it's, at the end, yeah. it's two years from the first genome, basically, that your, your genome becomes freely available. And so it is re relatively complicated, and when did the genome show up and so forth. So we have a website now that has all the dates <clears throat> saying either this is non embargo, so you can do whatever you want with it. Or these are embargoed until such and such a date. Yeah, this is one of the things that the U.S. has been moving a little bit away the from CGA embargo. Has that as well. And that so was the reason is because they said scientists are having a hard time figuring out whether yeah. the data so, they're analyzing so is under embargo or not. First, this page which has the dates and when it's embargoed and yeah. not, and we finally did it. Uh, we copied, we copied them basically and did the same thing. But uh, and CCGA is part of ICGC, but it's U.S. and so it's separate. Separate repositories, separate data access. So we always talk about the ICGC and we talk about the TCGA and ICGC, and the ICGC really means a non TCGA part of ICGC. Mm -hmm. because the TCGA is part of ICGC, but it's separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's kind of there's two separate data sets that yeah, can yeah. be accessed on so the US or on cancer in the US. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, if you look at the if you look at the publication guidelines, it's, I mean, I'm, a lot of these I'm kind of glossing over quickly for purpose of time, but I want to at least touch on kind of the main points. So if you're interested in publication, you might want to check out the publication policy uh, and the the duties that are essentially what my sister said. Uh, there's a bunch of privacy and security policies. Um, each are fairly. I mean, so the, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, I said GA4, GH1, is a fairly high level. Uh, are kind of principles oriented approach. Uh, the other two are shorter, although the, I'll go into more detail actually a bit later about the um, cloud security or security best practices for controlled access data. Um, There's also, similarly to like what we were talking about before, there are data sharing obligations of, of people who sign on based on uh, principles that come out of the genomics research community uh, for kind of rapid release of data. And then finally, there's intellectual property policies. And essentially, I mean, again, you'll have to read them to get the full idea. But essentially, the idea is that people who make use of ICGC data aren't allowed to apply for intellectual property uh, that would apply directly to the ICGC data that they, that they got. And they're also not allowed to apply for intellectual property rights that would block people's able, ability to access or use that data. Uh, and then beyond that, um, I believe there's a... So, those kind of obligations are actually in the ICGC guidelines I've listed at the top. The bottom two principles are kind of extending a bit beyond that. And, and they take a bit, a, kind of a pragmatic approach to IP and say that, um, so the NIH best practices essentially, if I want to kind of boil them down, they, they say that if you come up with a genomic discovery that is basically at or near where it needs to be in order to be kind of turned into a marketable commercial product, in that case, you shouldn't apply for IP. We're asking you not to. If it's going to require quite a bit more R&D work before it can get to market, then it's permissible to, to try to apply for patents and IP on it. And the, the idea is to make the data be as likely to produce results that help people as possible. So if it's going to need 
private sector investment. At least this is my understanding of, of the impetus behind it. If it needs private sector investment, then we'll kind of allow more IP rights. If it, if it doesn't in order to get to market, then we encourage you not to. But there's two hands here. Maybe another way of looking at it is sequence. If it's related to the sequence itself, the DNA sequence, the RNA sequence, it's not IP protected. Yeah, there's also that principle too. And so you do not put IP in the sequence. And so yeah. if you have a biomarker and you want to turn the biomarker or sequence itself, you don't, you don't want to go into the, the, the sort of path that many companies have taken, mm -hmm. for which you know, we can't even track a one or two testing anymore. So yeah, there was a big Supreme Court yeah. case in the US about that. Yeah, so we want to stay away. So, I, I, so, so obviously, you want to encourage drug development in the cancer world, mm -hmm. with that CDC. You want to encourage, so obviously, Developing a drug is very far away from the sequence, and so sort of like what you're saying, yeah, is requires a lot of intellectual development and, and R and D and so forth. And so that's very effective. But the sequence itself is not. And so now it's getting closer to saying that raw data is not protected. Mm -hmm. So raw data now we just had this discussion in Boston. It's, it's clinical data considered raw data now. Mm -hmm. That kind of, you know, so that becomes a little it's phenotype data. Yeah, my understanding is there's starting to be some challenges in the courts in Canada too. So we'll see where they come down on it. But unlike the, with the U.S., that the Supreme Court kind of weighed in pretty decisively there. What was was there a hand here too? No, what I'm saying, my my concern is in America one and two. Oh, okay, that you can't patent. I think like a lot of companies like Unimex will get around to maybe patent the cDNA because that's not mm -hmm. natural. Yeah, right. so yeah. get around to patent that cDNA of the virus, <laughs> just not the RNA. C -E. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's been tried by other countries as well. I mean, they've tried to patent like 200,000 years since. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so getting back to the DACO stuff, this was, I think, a, a suggested reading for beforehand, but this is a, a article that was published and that was maybe referenced on kind of the experience of the DACO over its first five years. And here they were here they were excited to say that they have, were able to process people when people submit the application that we saw online they were able to process them within a week and get people access to the data for icgc data at least 24 hours after that francis is now saying that it's taking a bit longer given the, the cloud, new context the because of the cloud context the cloud mm -hmm. uh, so they've been reporting this yeah <laughs> this paper was what date i don't see a date on it Oh, last year, okay. Yeah. Uh, but they've had, been having a steady increase. They're cheating a bit here because it, you can see it's cumulative um, applications process, but you can see there's a steady increase in new uh, new uh, I think projects access. The project that Christina's going to talk about and actually was responsible for a lot of the new applicants, so the PCOG project, Great. where we have about a thousand people working on it, and a lot of those people didn't have that go access. Mm -hmm. they needed it to go to the project they needed. Okay. So with that, maybe, I mean, I've kind of, I've given kind of a where to look for a lot of, I've given the big principles and where to look for more. Uh, on the privacy side, uh, we could talk about it more in discussion. I want to move a bit onto the security side of things, which is distinct, um, but somewhat similar. And so it's, I think it's important to keep privacy and security in mind is kind of two separate things. Uh, security breaches can result in privacy breaches, but they're not quite the same. And so um, they are characterized by trade-offs similar to, to kind of privacy. If you remember that you can't have perfect anonymization and perfectly usable data. Uh, again, you can't really have perfect data security unless you, your computer is shut off and not connected to the internet at any times. Uh, or similar to, you know, you can't have zero highway deaths and still have people driving, uh, driving in cars. Uh, and not to say that we should take this lightly, I think it's important to follow best practices. There's, as mentioned before, the consequences can be serious, but if you're looking for something that's going to absolutely uh, make sure you have no problems, it's unlikely that you'll find it. So I'm going to focus a bit on best practice in connecting to virtual machines here because that's what we're talking about uh, for the next couple sections too. Uh, talking especially about SSH encryption. Uh, which you can connect, 
make an encrypted connection to your VM through a password protected SSH or password SSH, but there are some shortcomings, including uh, people using weak passwords, people losing or forgetting their passwords, various other problems. So we're going to be talking about connecting to a virtual machine uh, using SSH key pair authentication, which is a common alternative. You can also use both at the same time. You can have a password and have the kind of key exchange happening. Or if, if everyone is very familiar with SSH already, perhaps I can breeze through this section, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, but all, people often also use, uh, if, you, if you're not required to use two, kind of a two-factor-ish kind of authentication, you can also use the keeper authentication on its own. So just to ex explain kind of the general idea of, of kind of the key pair exchange, the idea is if you have an insecure channel represented by this orange line between two computers, the general idea is you want some way to, to communicate securely without anyone else who's listening uh, be able to, to listen in. Um, so for our purposes, it's essentially going to be probably your laptop on one side. On the other side, it's going to be the Cancer Genome Collaboratory that you're wanting to connect to, or, or some other cloud uh, genomic research facility. And in between, we've got the internet. Uh, the way it works is you have your machine. Uh, we're, I think we're going to be doing this in the next workshop. George is going to be presenting how to do it, if I understand correctly. Uh, you get your, your laptop to generate a, a pair of uh, encryption, encryption keys. First of all, uh, what's called a private key. From that is derived a public key. Uh, and you can think of the, maybe it's bad to think of them this way, but you can think of them a bit like a username and a password. In a way, the public key is kind of like your username. It allows you to be identified. Uh, and the, the private key is kind of like your password. You don't want anyone to have access to it. Although the the analogy kind of breaks down because there's a special cryptographic relationship between the two keys where the public key is derived from the private key. Um, and so it doesn't always hold, but it's, it's one way to think of it. So the first thing you need to do um, to kind of set up the uh, key pair authentication is to send a copy of your public key over to the cloud. And if you'll notice, there's kind of already a big problem here where the whole point was we had an insecure channel and we've just sent a public key across this insecure channel and so someone could easily have, you know, the idea is you've got your ISP and a whole bunch of other intermediaries here. Someone who, some malicious person could have swapped it out uh, with something else to try to kind of do an attack on you from the middle. So in practice, you know, one way to get around it is you could copy your public key uh, over a USB key f or something, some physical way, but in practice there's ways I think we'll be doing it in the next workshop to securely copy your key even over the insecure or theoretically insecure network. Once that's set up, um, essentially through the magic of encryption, there's a key exchange process where the virtual machine you're connecting to uh, without being, without disclosing what your private key is can verify you're authentically who you say you are uh, and, you, and it can set up basically an encryption uh, tunnel where all the communication passing between you and the virtual machine are encrypted so people can see people along the network can see that you're communicating but they can't see what you're what you're communicating about um, and there's no worries about anyone either listening in or being able to kind of inject other malicious communications between you um, the nice thing about it is initially SSH uh, the shell part of, S of secure shell just refers to the ability to execute commands remotely, but through SSH tunneling, you can also do things like transfer files or basically run any arbitrary service um, remotely, including remote desktops. So you can essentially be set up to uh, act as though you're running and controlling the cloud from your, or a virtual machine in the cloud from your laptop. Um, the, the general idea as far as security obligations is to kind of minim minimize the number of ways things can go wrong in every way you can think of. And so um, you're going to be running the, the listening SSH listening service on a specific port. Uh, you want to kind of keep as much as possible every other port closed. Um, one idea that people often do is to try to have the SSH server running on a, on a random port number uh, rather than the kind of default one. So if someone's trying to find a way to connect, they won't be able to find it. This is kind of a security through obscurity approach. So it's maybe definitely best to combine with more reliable techniques. But it's one thing that people sometimes add on. Um, 
Your firewall should be blocking as many of the remaining ports as practical. You shouldn't be having unnecessary services running. Um, and it's also obviously crucial to limit any physical or other access to your private key. Uh, the um, a bunch of kind of basic techniques such as shutting down your virtual machine when not in use, um, consulting further resources including the security guide which I'll go over in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, it's a good idea to prohibit password only SSH connections to the virtual machine so that no one can try to guess if you have an easy or no password and so that only kind of key pair authentication can be used. Um, and in general, there's some other basic ideas like not to ignore any SSH authentication warnings that you see. If you don't understand one, you should ask someone who does before you agree to override it. One common one that might come up is something that looks like this. Uh, if you remember when I had the diagram of the SSH communication, we had transferred our public key to the cloud, which allows it to identify us, but we never got the cloud's public key to us, making sure we can identify it. So this is a, essentially a warning message that will come up if their cryptographic fingerprint seems to have changed, and maybe they're not who they say they are, um, which can happen for a variety of legitimate or unlegitimate reasons. Um, so getting close to the end now before we could have a discussion if people want, I'll talk a bit about kind of the what the ICGC security best practices call for. Again, you'll have to read the whole thing to get the full idea. But the basic idea is it's based out of um, an idea that you should be running a kind of independent assessment when you begin your project, depending on your that's tailored to your specific project to figure out what security measures should be in place that will differ based on the size and the nature of your project. But the, the agreement does list uh, a number of specific considerations to take into account um, when doing so, which are, are largely based on kind of minimization of vulnerability, or potential vulnerabilities. So including things like uh, policies for when data will be destroyed, which should happen when it's no longer needed, um, abilities to log who's entering the system, to be able to audit it, uh, a variety of kind of physical safety measures, so if you're, you should avoid physically transferring data as much as possible. If you have to do so, data should be encrypted at rest. The expression they use is that you should treat physical data like it's cash, and so transport it in the ways that you would, and using the security measures that you would use as though you were transporting cash. Um, in general, if you're, uh, as far as network security, end-to-end -end encryption of kind of the SSH variety is always preferred. Um, People who are going to be using the system should be trained. Um, and for, as far as cloud-specific recommendations, um, they, they're specifically about the relationship with the cloud service provider often to make sure that the cloud service provider is someone who's reliable, that the agreement is going to allow you to fulfill all your obligations, that there's going to be a clear division of responsibility between the cloud service provider and your project, um, and, and so on. And so I think I've covered kind of most of the things. To get the full details, you can look at the uh, security best practices document. It's, I, th I think it's only five or six pages. It's not, ex not too painful. Um, it's also sometimes helpful to consult other, other outside resources that can have specific, uh, I've pulled up one here from a, a, a blog. That, I mean, it's good to make sure you're looking at a kind of reputable reputable advice rather than non-reputable, but um, some articles had specific ideas for hardening SSH security and specifically cloud virtual machines context. I've already talked a bit about reviews and auditing. So to, one thing is to avoid considering, there's a tendency to want to consider risks and set up security procedures only when establishing a new system rather than prospectively. Uh, but periodic review is important and, and when possible or when called for by the nature of the project, third party party auditing. Um, and not only because your, your project evolves, so for example, if you've got different people with access to your data who've all sent their, their public keys to your virtual machine, you might want to review if there are people's keys who should still be in there or sh they should be removed. But aside from your project evol evolving, there's also the fact that uh, data security best practices are, are constantly evolving. There's constantly new attacks and new vulnerabilities coming out. Not to be overly alarmist, as maybe um, this following article, this headline is, new cloud attack takes full control of virtual machines with literal, little effort. 
Uh, this just came out, I think, a month ago. Uh, but it, but this, the idea here was was I think it only works in spe very specific contexts. But it was a kind of it, a lot of these techniques are are unforeseeable. The, the idea here was that you could actually uh, by writing really aggressively to one space, I believe in RAM, you could actually flip some bits in the, another part of the, the, not the user space, but the system space and take control. Uh, it, it's a bit uh, isolated, but but it is good to uh, to be doing ongoing review as security vulnerabilities are constantly changing and being updated. And so with that, I think I'm ending uh, a fair bit early, but if there's any discussion or further questions, that people want to raise, I'm happy to.